only mode. All right, hello. Um, today we have a presentation. A webinar presented by Intraphone and Hampton Marketing, and today we'll be covering the eight things you didn't know about PPC and SEO. Um, well, there's probably a lot of things that we don't know about PPC and SEO, but one of the big topics we're going to go over today is talking about the actual myths and kind of the misconceptions that people have about the two aspects of search engine and marketing. So, speaking right now is Jacob Fairclaw, I'm an account manager at Hampton Marketing, and I say I mostly specialize in PPC, but I also do a little bit of work with automation. And your other host today is going to be Eric from Intro Promote, and I'll let him introduce himself. Hey, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for attending today. I really appreciate uh, the webinars that we do with Hannapin, and uh, we are looking forward to presenting some things that you, you may not know about our two respective disciplines today, along with some things that you probably really do know, but maybe we'll add a new dimension or two to those. So thank you. All right, and any time if you want to join in on the conversation for this webinar, just make sure to include the hashtag ThinkPPC in your tweets, or use the webinar question box to send us questions. Um, you can point out any questions you have during, and towards the end of the webinar, we'll actually go through some of these questions and try and answer as many as we can. All right, so we're going to start off with a few live poll questions. These live poll questions are just to get a little bit of a, a better metric on our audience and what their experience is, what their roles are. So we're going to start off with number one. How long have you been involved in search engine marketing? A, less than one year. B, one to three years. C, three to five years. Or D, five plus years. Me personally, I fall into a B. How about you, Eric? Um, I have been involved in search marketing since uh, hardcore SEO since about 2002. So I would go down to the bottom, I guess. Very nice. <clears throat> And I want to tell our, our uh, listeners today and our viewers, uh, this stuff is really to help us shape future webinars, and we really appreciate your feedback because it helps us shape the content, tell us what sort of uh, experience level the attendees are at so that it really helps you in the end. So we really appreciate your feedback. Right. Yeah, and the results actually just came in. And, yeah, kind of what I, oh, I've seen on the other webinars, we have a, a lot of people who are kind of young in their careers. We have a a good chunk, a little less than a third at less than one year, 45% at one to three years, but then we have about 25% which appear to have over three years of experience. So we got a nice spread today. Terrific. Go on to number two. All right. This is uh, regarding how you manage your PPC accounts. We're going to have an SEO question later, so I get the privilege of, of jumping across the pond today and uh, asking about how you manage your specific PPC campaign. First option is you manage it yourself. Next, you're part of a team that manages it. Third, you outsource the account management. Account management, sorry. Or D, maybe it's one of those first three, but you're really rethinking about how you want things to be managed. So go ahead and enter your answer, and we will uh, tally the results. Excellent. Well. Wow. Over half, almost two thirds seem to manage it themselves, and uh, that's either themselves or on house or in house. That uh, that seems to be the vast majority of the people. What do you think, Jacob? Yes, I'm saying yeah. I'm kind of curious. I thought there needs to be a follow up question along with this. If I manage it in house, or it's um, you know people coming in from agencies where I guess technically they do manage it themselves, even though right. I can outsource. Maybe we just need another option as well. All right, so I'm going to start off with PPC myth number one, and kind of a simple title, but one of the things um, that kind of trips people up is, well, isn't PPC just about the keywords? Isn't it just selecting the, the right keywords, putting in the account, and, well, then you make money off of them, so I don't know, you know why I have to spend more time on my account, or in some instances, why would you outsource to an agency? Do you really need someone to look through a list of keywords to add? And it's kind of funny, I had an example once of a <laughs> client, very smart guy, but hadn't done a whole lot with PBC in the past, and um, just kind of came along and said, I have this list of, you know, about 5,000 keywords that I think would be relevant to our account. How soon can we get those added and everything running? And it was kind of like taking that step back and saying, you know, well, there's all a whole lot of things that go along with that. You know, there's ad groups, campaigns, ad copy, all this other stuff that we have to do 
to get these to run well. And you know, um, if you only focus on the keywords, I mean, this is kind of taking it back to maybe some of those misconceptions of SEO, where it's like just stuff as many keywords as you can on the page, and you'll you'll be fine. There's, you know, that's the heart of it. You're neglecting all the aspects of the conversion rate optimization, your web page design, your ad writing, looking at your modifiers, when are you advertising, where are you advertising, as well as looking at your purchase cycle. You know, how often do the users buy? Do you know, is there a lag from when they start? For instance, um, worked with a client who sold, I guess, short-term insurance for things like vacation and everything. And you know, if you're looking at it wrong, you'd say, oh, we just aren't getting conversions. But if you actually start digging into the data, you see, well, there seems to be a lag here. People start shopping way beforehand. So even if these keywords don't seem to be driving a lot of conversions, they're driving that awareness early in the process, and the user ends up coming back and converting later. You know, Jacob, when you talk about the 5,000 keywords, what I like about that is there, there's a, a very comparable thing over on the organic side. Matt Cutts of Google, who a lot of you probably heard of, uh, described the process of just simply sending out press releases and syndicating them in as many places as you can or getting your content spread out without any real uh, forethought to where it's going or who's going to be looking at it. He calls that spray and pray. And I thought that, that that phrase came into my mind when you said, well, can't we just dump 5,000 keywords into these bids? Because there's so much more than volume when we're talking about this. So yeah, I like that. Thank you. Um, when we talk about SEO myths or misconceptions or things you might not know, everyone says, oh, SEO, it's so high tech and it's so, it's so new. And you know, in terms of online marketing, it's really no longer new. There's new techniques all the time. But really, SEO is a much older, you know, or is a newer form of something that's very, very old. In this ad, you can see, you know, I, I just pulled a picture of the local plumbers, and you look at how plumbers and other verticals try to get first listing in the yellow pages, and before the yellow pages, you know, there was no such thing as AAA plumbing supply or AAA restaurant supply. AAA, um, with, <laughs> without regard to the American Automobile Association, but when you name something like this, this was because all these alphabetical um, listings, you know, you wanted to be up first when you turned to the plumbing section. SEO, SEO is really no different from that. It's about getting visibility where the eyeballs are. And if you look um, on the next slide, think about all the various different methods of information retrieval we've had not only through the decades but through the centuries. I mean you have your town crier, you have people gathered around the radio, or you have them huddled around the newspaper. You go to the library. You need to be where people are seeking out information. So in that sense, if you think about SEO as just the next sort of iteration of that, it's really not a new marketing tactic. Now the barriers to entry have changed. You know when in the 90s when everyone could have a website, everyone suddenly thought, all right, the barriers to entry have been eradicated. You know, we can all do this together now, and it's a level playing field. And it's not a level playing field. You know, big brands are always going to have an edge because they're big brands, but really why it's not a level playing field now is because the scales have tipped uh, in the favor of people who are very innovative and who have a tremendous message and who are experts in their field. So it's not whether you, you know, it's not just owning a thousand domains and putting the same sort of content on each one. That doesn't level the playing field. And really the, the sort of changes that Google has made in regard to thin content and uh, people trying to manipulate link popularity, that sort of stuff has leveled the playing field to the extent that if you come into business now, people pretty much, uh, if they're paying attention, they no longer th are trying to think of tricks to get ahead. They're really focused on the message and the user. And that's what we always try to, to emphasize to, to our clients. You know, this, this is about connecting with them on their turf when they're looking for information that you are an expert in. So that's really, you know, um, that's really how we describe it. I mean, SEO is, <clears throat> is a new flavor of it, but um, it's a very, very old technique. Yeah, kind of going along with you, Eric. I mean, that's at least to the, a certain extent talking about, you know, it's not just the keywords. We're kind of talking about the same thing here that, you know, this is all part of the, the greater marketing sphere. It's, it's not something magical that we're doing, which I think sometimes people have that misunderstanding. So, you know, 
why can't you make it work? You'd be like, well, it has to fit with the rest of the business to make it work, and has to you know be reasonable, exactly. and you know reach people who are looking to buy. Right, and it, you know, one even within SEO, which is you know pretty much about twenty years old now. You know, there's been so much change there. Um, before, really, before the directories came of age, before Yahoo's directory and before the Open Directory project came around, the web was a real mess. Um, you you know you looked in magazines to find the current hot websites of the week that people had uncovered, or you looked in a newspaper column, and it was a real combination, a real messy combination of old and new technology. And we just pulled for this, you know, a very a, a sort of a funny uh, headline back when the new Alta Vista launched. Uh, finally. Uh, in November of 1999, you know, going on 15 years, um, you know, now touted as a challenger against the more established portals such as Yahoo, Excite, and Lycos. And um, back then, it's it had increased the uh, size of its index by two thirds to a quarter of a billion pages. And now, I think conservative estimates are that Google's relevant web index is roughly 50 billion uh, web pages. So. Um, that <laughs> that's a significant change, and that's you know we we grow in scale, but really the you know the the techniques or the the goals are really are really the same. Let's let's be somewhere where people are searching for things, but let's not lose them. Let's let's give them a reason to stick around. So that's the end of my first myth or the first thing about SEO that you might not really consider. Okay, yeah, jump in with that. Go into PPC myth number two. You need to be in the top spots. A lot of the time, that there's kind of this conception that you have to be number one, otherwise your, you know, the impressions or the clicks are just wasted. Like, you know, maybe it's this idea that if you're not number one, you're losing. And one of the biggest direct impacts of not being in that number one spot, and it perhaps said, you know, maybe you just want to bid down a bit. Well, won't my click-through rate decrease? And you have to go well. Yeah, there seem to be a whole lot of people click that first first ad. Sometimes I wonder if they accidentally click it because the click-through rate could just be so much higher than number two. But sometimes, yeah, being the first has its benefits. And won't I lose traffic? So I kind of went to the spoiler alert. Yes, you'll lose a little traffic and your click-through rate de will decrease. But you don't always have to be in the top spot to get to conversions. And for most advertisers, it's probably not worth it to be in that top spot just because it's going to cost you so much more. And in general, that the paid search space has gotten so competitive, if I had to give you a ballpark here, every now and then you come across these where you might be spending, it seems like, 30% more to really kind of push up to get that really high average position, where you should just dial back a lot, take a lot of clicks instead of a, a super large amount of clicks, take the conversions you can get at the cheaper price, and you'll be a lot more successful and be able to kind of your budget into areas where maybe you can end up making up the lost revenue in other areas by targeting different keywords. I don't know if saying lost revenue is the right one because you aren't really losing it if you didn't have it. But hopefully the idea carried across there. So one of the things you can do is to just take a look at your your metrics and segment by your position. Like I guess you might get a lot more traffic at the number one spot, but it's not uncommon to look and say, but my CPA is actually a lot lower at the two spot. The other reason you might want to segment is to also look at the different times of the day. I don't want to get too much into this because it's really a technique thing, but you might look and see that your average position kind of varies throughout the day and kind of gives you an idea of what your competitors are actually doing during the space which then can influence your strategy and say, you know, when is it worth bidding up and when is it not. So don't bid higher just because you can. If you're worried about the CTR and quality score, which is the other big worry that comes up, although click-through rate is a big factor in the quality score, we don't know exactly, but it seems to have a big influence, it's all calculated relative to the position. So you won't be punished with a lower quality score just because you're bidding down to the other position. Google's going to kind of normalize those quality scores based around what position your ad's actually showing and your expected click-through rate. Very cool. Well, the second thing that you might not necessarily know about SEO is really it's easier than you think. And a lot of people are like, oh, but I don't, you know, I'm, I come from PPC or I come from social. I, I, you know, SEO is an entirely different discipline. Well, that's true. It is. 
but we believe that it's it's a it's a situation that the Pareto principle <clears throat> excuse me really applies to in other words we think that you know you can get about 80 percent of the results accomplished with about 20 percent of the knowledge that a full-blown full-time SEO might have now that has to be the right 20 percent of knowledge uh, you can't just you know read one article from one site and think okay I'm an expert there has to be some research involved but we boil our SEO methodology down to a fairly simple methodology that we call CIRTA, which is just an acronym, C-I-R-T-A. But that stands for the linear process that we use in making sure that a, an SEO program is formulated correctly. And the process is crawling, indexing, ranking, traffic, and then finally action. Now, how do those things work together? You can't have a page rank for something until it's crawled and until it's indexed. The person, the visitor, cannot come to your site and perform that desired action until they click over from a search result. So, in other words, it's it's really premature to worry about things, numbers like three, four, and five, until you've worried about items one and two. Now, on the next slide, I've, I've created a little matrix that discusses exactly how we can measure these basic KPIs. I'm going to talk about advanced versions of these later on, but for now, how do you make sure that your site is crawled correctly? Well, you can use a crawling tool. Uh, we are big fans of uh, the Screaming Frog SEO spider on our, on our SEO team. Uh, there are a lot of free or cheap tools that will do that, and you can just tell it to mimic a search engine, to tell it, you know, crawl everything a search engine should be able to crawl, and if it can't crawl very far into it, you know, you have some architectural errors that need to be fixed. You can also use uh, Google Webmaster Tools, which is a free service provided by Google. They will tell you um, what your robots.txt file might be doing. They'll tell you how many errors Google's finding when it crawls through your site, what, what kinds of errors those are. That's very helpful information. If you can come up and say, I think my site should have 2,500 URLs, and Google knows about 50 of them, then you've got a problem. So that's a very simple way to make sure that engines are crawling correctly is to look at the metrics like I've described there. Indexing is when uh, an engine has not only seen your page but it considers it relevant enough to include in its index or its available collection of pages. In other words, that makes it eligible to appear for a search query. So you can uh, create XML sitemaps and you can submit those through Webmaster Tools. You can see what the uh, indexing percentages. If you submit an XML sitemap with 2,500 URLs in it, but Google indexes only 300 of those, then we're going to have to dig a little deeper. But if most of those URLs are form are formed correctly and they're not duplicates of each other and there are no mixed signals or mixed messages you're sending, you should get a pretty high percentage of all those URLs indexed. Ranking, of course. Um, you know, everyone knows what ranking is. It's when you search for something and where do you appear on that search results page or who appears above you. That, that's even more frustrating. Um, Webmaster Tools will tell you what you're ranking for and what average position you have. There are uh, third-party rank checkers out there, uh, SEO platforms. Uh, but the search queries report in Google Webmaster Tools is a pretty good place to start. And, of course, again, it's free, so you don't have to worry about forking down a lot of money for this. Um, finally, traffic. Traffic is when you, you ranking for a term isn't enough. You need to appeal to the user. You need to make sure that the that the information they see on the search results page is relevant enough that they're going to click over because you have a lot of competition. You have uh, all of Jacob's clients in the PPC spots. You have nine other organic uh, comp competitors in the organic spots. You have maybe maps or uh, shopping search results or uh, Google carousel results. There's a lot of competition on that search results page, so there are techniques you can use. Uh, maybe it's some microformatting or some other things we can get into later uh, that um, will make your results stand apart from the others. And then finally, the action. Um, a long time ago, SEO thought its job was only to get people to the site, and that's just not good enough. Once they get there, are they doing what you want, or are we losing them along the way? So. We set up goals in analytics, you know, like when it, maybe it's a download, maybe it's a certain amount of time spent on the site or a certain number of page views, maybe it's actual purchase. Uh, and then the funnels are the path that we want people to take. If we have a five-step funnel and we keep losing people at step number three, 
time to examine why that is. So this really, I mean, if you look at this grid and think heavily about those those five KPIs, you are well on your way to creating a, a foundation for an SEO program. All right, poll question number three, and this is about organic search. How big a priority is your organic search? Um, we bring in a nice mix of audience members to these. Some are heavily PPC focused, some are heavily organic focused. A lot of them are in the middle. So how big a priority is your organic search? Do you watch it like a hawk? Do you watch it not so closely? Uh, is it something on the back burner till you get the time or the resources or the right person to deal with it? Or is it completely off your radar? So go ahead and submit and um, we'll take a look at the result. That's a nice mix. There are very few people who don't seem to know much about organic search. Uh, the other three are fairly evenly divided. So at least it looks like 70% of you are at least keeping an eye on it, maybe very thoroughly. Um, about a quarter of you are, it's on your mind, but not, not right at the front. So very good. Thank you very much for those results. So PPC myth number three, you don't need to bid on brands. And uh, I put at the top is probably the biggest quote you hear about, well, isn't bidding on brand just paying for the traffic that I should be bringing in organically? Uh, kind of. <laughs> not, not specifically, though. And one of the biggest worries is I've never seen an issue where brand spent that much or paid too, paid too much. One of the things that you have to think about is that the brand quality, uh, brand traffic is going to be qualified since they're already searching for your brand, and it's going to be pretty cheap. That's why um, I had the qualification a little hesitation earlier because I guess if you had a brand that had a very generic name, like I don't know what it would be, like the soda company or something like that, you might have a, a real problem with bidding on that just because that, that could be a very generic term. But generally, those branded Branded terms are super cheap. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to an example on the next slide, but I think for one of my clients, we're spending maybe a few bucks a click. Their branded traffic comes in uh, an average of six cent CPCs and converts very well. So it's one of the, you're gonna be paying a little bit, but the payoff is so much higher. But the the biggest thing um, I know you mentioned this earlier, talking about the search space is it's just going to let you take up more of the page, no matter where the user is looking, whether they see the organic ads first, whether they see the paid ads first. Because one of the things I don't think people realize as much, unless you're doing a lot of searches, is that Google is constantly changing the layout of the page, kind of showing where different ads, it's, it gives us a lot of headaches in the PBC space, saying, you know, where are these ads going to show up, because that can really affect your metrics and how much attention they get. But yeah, so it's, Looking at that, lost my train of thought. I was going to say, it reminded me of a note one time we were talking to someone from Google, and it was the warning. It was like, um, you know, uh, sometimes the ad testing is great, but you have no idea how much stuff we're testing on our end. So it, it's cute that you're doing that, but uh, <laughs> we got a lot of stuff going on. So one of the things that also kind of limits it is the brands are heavily favored in the search results. Um, I'm sure for our visitors who are on the PPC side, they found, you know, I don't seem to get a whole lot of traffic or a whole lot of views sometimes when I'm bidding on my competitor terms or I'm trying to do a few query searches maybe from a private browser to see what happens when I search for these terms and I'm just not seeing anything because well Google's just not showing them. Get a little bit of echo I think. Okay. Sorry I had a little bit of a technical difficulty there. So going in, um, bidding on the browser allows you to take the spot a lot of the competitors who are also bidding on your brand terms. I think this is, I've been hearing this, seeing this more and more of, often I'm seeing competitors bid on my client's brand terms. And you don't want your competitors showing up, especially if the ads are gonna be at the top of the page, showing up above your organic searches. So the first thing they see is actually your competitor's ad. And, you know, thinking that Google is going to show me the best result, they end up clicking on that, going to a different site, and maybe even making a purchase from that. 
um, kind of hinted at, you could see very, very low CPAs and very high return on ad spends. Um, this is the same one I talked about the CPC score, that the CPA, um, our goal is somewhere around 30. Um, the return on ad spend comes out to about 450%. Our brand campaign right now a dollar twenty six CPA and a return on ad spend of twelve thousand percent. So when you have it that large, it's it's going to say, uh, I'm willing to open up my wallet a little bit just to make sure that I'm getting that money coming in. So if you have a semi known brand, use it. Brand always does super well. Um, the only time I haven't seen it do well was in the case where it was a very small company without any, like real brand recognition or anything like that. Jacob, how does it work when you are trying to compete with a big brand? What sort of strategies can you provide if you are the little guy in a situation like that on the PPC side? It's a really good question, and um, I'm sure it might be that way in SEO that the big the big answer in PPC is the very annoying, it depends. Right. <laughs> one of the things you have to do is probably going back to the earlier one, um, especially for something like e-commerce where you're faced up against really big companies, you don't want to go head-to-head -head on everything, especially some of those, I guess you'd say the more generic terms. So maybe you were bidding on athletic shoes. You might not want to say, I'm going to aim for the number one spot on basketball shoes because right. you're going to have um, other competitors that say Foot Locker, Dick Sporting Goods, Sports Authority. I'm, you know, It's going to kind of vary by region, but all of them are bidding on those same terms and pushing them up. So it's one of the best ways is just to dive deeper a little bit with the smaller accounts because one of the things you're going to find is um, I'm sure anyone who has ever searched for a product on Google, you're always going to see Amazon and eBay ads because they're just going to bid on absolutely everything. But the penalty of doing that on their end is they don't seem to ever get as specific. So if you start digging in, finding those not necessarily the longer tail keywords, but the keywords that aren't going to have as much competition. You know, there aren't as many people bidding on them. This doesn't even have to be something that's very, very long, but even saying, I'm just going to bid on the exact match of specific model numbers or something like that. Mm -hmm. Something that's going to get overlooked in these massive scale operations. And you can say, you know, I'm really going to just lock these products down. Focus on these, not going to worry about the generic as much. If we see success and start bringing in a lot more revenue, we'll sure. branch out there. But let's just find out what we're best at, lock that down, and then keep moving from there. Yeah, the, reason the other side of that, no, oh, sorry, I was going to say the other side of that sometimes is also really working on your ad copy. Because that's the same thing. You'll realize that the Amazons and Ebays bid on every single thing and they also run the exact same ad for every single thing. So if you can kind of put something that's appealing, whether you have special shipping offers, whether you have, um, you know, exclude, why am I tripping up on that? An exclusive line of products or something that differentiates your products or service, you want to push that in there, and that's going to look a whole lot better than just saying, hey, we have this stuff in stock. Right. Yeah, that's really that's really uh, helpful. The reason I asked is be a couple of reasons. A couple of years ago, uh, Google made some changes uh, algorithmically to the organic side that really uh, did a uh, dealt a body blow to bigger brands. I mean, a couple of years ago, you could search for Toyota or Amazon, and various parts of those domains would run at least to the fold. You know, you would have three, four, six, eight maybe results at a top out of the ten coming to your domain, especially if you had a big subdomain system set up um, along with site links and big brands were just owning that branded real estate. And they really changed that up to where if you do searches for those now, uh, you know, uh, you'll get one, maybe two uh, along with site links now and then the rest of the eight are uh, other domains. And we informally we call that you know the domain diversity algorithm um, and that was a you know I think the people that benefited from that were you know people informational sites like Wikipedia or Hoover's or business profiles or things like that um, but for the little guys one one place that we've had a little success on the organic side is um, focusing on the frustrations and the problems of big branded products and 
writing up some detailed information about that, like let's say um, a specific product. I don't know what it is. This this particular um, sports watch. But if there's a a page about it and it has known problems, a lot of times the brand is reluctant to uh, publish a lot of information about dissatisfied customers. Whereas if you're a, a, um, a, a repair site or you uh, create a competing product, uh, the frustrations with a certain product, uh, if they're well known, people are searching for those because people are out there looking for opinions similar to theirs. Hey, what did this other guy do if he had the same problem with his watch that I'm having? That sort of thing. So uh, I think it all boils down to you know really judicious selection of the types of terms you're going after and that really goes back to your first point about not just dumping everything out on the table and hoping something works, but really being smart about, about your pursuits. So with that, <laughs> with that soliloquy wrapped up, uh, let me go into number three. You know, it's the exact opposite of number two. One of the things you might not realize if you're just starting out is that SEO is quite a bit harder than you think. And well, why is he saying it's harder than you think if he just said it's easier than you think? Well, think about the 80-20 rule. We figured out how to get 80% of this accomplished with 20% of the results, but you know the the mathematical counterpart to that is how do we get that last 20% of results? Well, it's through 80% of the hard work, and there's a lot going on in the organic space from an architectural perspective, from an analytics perspective, uh, from a coding perspective. That you know if you're really, really trying to take your program from an A- minus to an A+, plus that you'll need to, uh, to take advantage of and to pay close attention to. Um, on the next slide, I created a table that's very similar to the other table that I talked about when we talked about the crawling, indexing, ranking, traffic, and action elements. Uh, but how do we pay attention to these KPIs in an, at an advanced level? Well. Uh, at the crawling level, we can pay attention to our crawling logs. We can see what the cache dates are for specific pages. We can tell how often Google's crawling our site. Um, Google uses something that informally, well, maybe it's formally. I don't know if they use it in-house, but in, in the SEO community, we call a crawl budget. And it's a budget like your household budget. You have a fixed amount of dollars, and you have to accomplish a lot of things with that fixed amount every month. With Google, it's more of a time or bandwidth budget. They have X amounts of gigabytes that they're going to allocate to your site, or an X amount of minutes, or however it is they, they choose to define it. They're going to spend X amount on your site. You don't want them spending it on uh, eight different versions of the same URL. So you need to make sure your canonicalization and your uh, no indexing tags and your uh, robots file is all set up so that Google's crawling the pages you want them to crawl and not wasting time on the things you don't want them to. And that leads right into indexing. You can tell how many of a certain URLs are indexed by uh, special commands like the site command at a Google prompt. Again with canonical tags, parameter handling, you can say anytime you're sorting URLs, like if you have a, if you sell uh, L LED TVs, you can sort them from highest to lowest price, you can sort them by uh, screen size, you can sort them by consumer uh, favorable uh, ratings, Any, you know, you've been on a Amazon or Best Buy or some sort of site like that, but that's great that you can do that for the user experience, but you don't want Google crawling and indexing all of those URLs, all of which show the same 50 TVs just sorted in different ways. That's a waste of everybody's time and Google's not going to index all those pages. So you might as well save time and tell it ahead of time, here are the types of pages you should crawl and index, here are the types you shouldn't, and that's going to be a much more uh, efficient use of the crawl budget that Google has allocated to your site. Now in ranking, uh, if you use an SEO platform or a rank checker or uh, any of the, the free or, or low cost tools like the Moz tool set will let you uh, cover, you know, watch the rankings of uh, a great deal of keywords. It's hard to um, really get a look at the success of a campaign by looking keyword by keyword. Well, one keyword's up down from spot three to spot one. Well, the other we on the other side we got one from spot one to spot three. It's a lot easier, a lot more efficient, in our opinion, to kind of build those lists of keywords into portfolios or uh, 
segments or categories. Here's my, here's my branded words. Here's my non-branded words. Here's my product. Here's here are my keywords for a specific product. Here are uh, my keywords for you know the blue version of that product. You need to watch the the rankings in aggregate to really get an idea of the overall success of your site. Now you need to watch rankings. Um, alongside overall search traffic because you know you're, you're every single site out there I guarantee you is ranking for words that they never expected to rank for so there's a whole list of unknowns out there that you're ranking for that's bringing you traffic that might be converting that you probably don't have in your in your rank checker so that's another dimension to keep track of you you know there's a whole world out there besides the 50 or 500 or 5,000 words you're, you're watching uh, for the ranks at month in and month out in terms of traffic, again, you go back to analytics. You look, uh, you know, in the world where keywords are now not provided, and that's where I get very envious of what Jacob does because when Jacob looks at keyword reports, he knows exactly what they clicked and he knows what the query was. Whereas organic uh, search now, up to 90% or more of our the specific keywords that people clicked on are obscured due to Google's secure search. Uh, Quite a controversial move, but it is the world we live in now on the organic side, so we deal with it and move on. But we, you know, we do need ways to continue to find that keyword data, whether it's through webmaster tools and a, a good look at uh, the last 30, 60, 90 days worth of organic keywords that people are clicking on, whether we're looking at the landing page that they came to, at least we have that data. You need an idea of where your traffic's coming from, where it's going once it gets to your site. And then finally with uh, the action. How do we measure effectively what people are doing? And not only what people are doing, but who we give credit to. Um, one of the real hot topics now is the attribution modeling of web traffic. You know, they maybe they first came from an organic click, uh, but they didn't do anything. Ten days later, they came back on a PPC click and they actually bought something. So who gets credit for that? Well, that's a fairly uh, active and vigorous discussion right now uh, going on in online marketing circles. Um, a lot of people will give the credit to the medium or channel that produced the actual click. In my example, it would be PPC, but would they have known about your site if they hadn't come on that organic click? So there, you know, there are models where uh, you can give partial credit to certain channels. There are some models where you give all of the credit to the channel that gave the last click. Whatever it is, know how your channels are working together so that you can have a picture of how, you know, uh, what sort of partnership your PPC and your social media and your SEO has. Um, we'll probably talk a little bit more about that later on, but uh, Google Analytics down in the behavior section uh, has some really nice reports about uh, attribution modeling. So uh, to sum up, you know, there are there are ways of really keeping track of that last 20% of SEO success, but it does take a lot of research and a lot of testing, a lot of experimentation, but the information's out there. No, you got a, a, a good point. I, I guess I thought about too, because like you said, it's a very vigorous debate for the attribution models. And I guess part of it, yeah, it's, it's, it's very tricky. One of the interesting things along with it is, um, I think especially in paid search, I think we're very scared of using words like awareness and things like that. But it, there have been instances where you know you're running a large display campaign. It doesn't seem to be driving a lot of, uh, especially if you're looking at the top level, the last click conversions. And then you have an instance where it's like, well, uh, client says we just want to shut this down, and then you get in this weird situation where if you don't look at the attribution model and see, you know, that these there's a lot of um, view through conversions so people who are seeing the ads and then converting later, that you just start cutting out of people out of that funnel, not knowing it, and then you're faced like a month or two later, like, you know, what did we do wrong that revenue dropped? So right. taking, yeah, like you said, having goals and taking that larger, larger view about how it all fits together is really necessary to kind of make digital marketing successful. Right, and I can understand the reluctance to talk about um, awareness uh, because you know historically web marketing has been very metrics driven we know they came we know they did something we know exactly why they did it when they did it and to go back to that 
you know, maybe the, the, the 1950s billboard model of, well, we had a sign out on Interstate 5 and we're just, you know, we, we counted cars and we know how many people go by there every day and business is up 2.5%, so we're going to assign it there. That's, that, that makes people nervous and I understand that. And then you throw in remarketing to that, which I'm sure on the PPC side is yet another uh, variable, but that stuff works. And you know, you're, I, I know on the PPC side, you guys are getting better and better at, at showing exactly how it does work. Um, but yeah, I can understand that because I think web marketers have become very, not, I don't want to say spoiled, but they've become very used to having a great deal of data at their fingertips compared to more historic or classic forms of advertising. So. Um, whenever you remove that hardcore uh, solid line from point A to point B, people get a little nervous and they start to wonder if, they're, if their money's in the right place. And I, I get that. But I think a lot of these analytics packages are getting a lot better at helping people connect those points. Yeah, we've talked about metric, metrics so much. Yeah, we'll, go, we'll go on to the next slide for our, our listeners in a second. But yeah, we've told you to focus on your metrics, but sometimes don't focus on the metrics and do something else. <laughs> right. Okay, so this is uh, myth number four. It's kind of a, a catch-all, and I will make sure that I don't turn this into a uh, PPC account manager rant. Uh, that might be entertaining, but uh, I don't think it's going to be very helpful for anybody. So um, what, where this came from was I think it was in the New York Times, and another account manager summed it up best, where it's just small business owners saying, oh, PPC just doesn't work anymore. And they kind of said, you know, the byline should actually be, I spent $100 on PBC and didn't make anything from it. This isn't going to work. And um, anyone, I guess, who's been involved in PBC or in marketing in general has seen kind of the budgets. Um, for better or worse, PBC can take up a lot of money, especially depending on the space, um, depending on the product, especially for something like lead gen, for education or financial services, if it's going to lead to a big payoff if this person signs. Those bids get pretty expensive. So it's one of those you have to be kind of aware of the situation. You can't just say, um, I'm doing everything right. Why aren't I getting the five cent CBCs? One time I had, um, oh, I don't want to call out the people on the C-level, but a C-level from a, uh, a client contact me and said, you know, our, our CPAs need to be $7 where <laughs> we were bidding. We were in like the number six spot. We were getting down to the bottom of the page. And even that was, um, costing $15, $16 a click. So it's like your CPA is not going to get lower. You have to step back and explain that and say, you know, it's an auction system. You know, you have to operate within the auction system. You can't really circumvent it at all. And part of the reason for the competitiveness is because I think over the last few years there's been a lot of toting, especially like we just talked about. You know, you have all these metrics. You don't have to just put up ads and guess what works. You can actually find out what works so people are, you know, flocking into these areas trying to get in on the uh, the action, you could say, and it's not too hard on the PPC side. Um, going back to number one, you could just add some keywords, and you know, a lot of people are already doing PPC, but there's still more and more coming in. New businesses are starting; they're trying to get in, just kind of crowding the field, making it harder to really stand out without much effort. So. Summing it up, if you don't invest in planning and organization, you can't expect great results. Um, for instance, you can't just throw some basic terms in there and expect that users are ever going to convert. Either you're going to bring in poor quality traffic uh, on the, the warning sign when I try and explain to people coming into PPC why it's so dangerous, especially just to put broad match terms in your account. One time I was doing an audit on an account for someone who said PPC is not working for me and found they were just bidding on broad match gas station. And they had thousands of impressions and I think all except for a handful came from people looking for directions to gas stations. So I was like, well, there, that's, that's part of your problem right there. You need to uh, make sure you know you have your negatives in place. It's not just thinking what are users searching for, but what, what ads could be triggered for people that are actually searching for this product. You don't have. You shouldn't plan on winning right away either. Um, like I said, so many people are in on PPC right now. But when someone's just getting started or trying to expand, you probably aren't going to win right away. You're going to have a few. Uh, you're going to get knocked down a few times and say, 
you know, I thought this was the perfect keyword. This was almost the exact name of the product, but it's just not converting. You know, those are instances where maybe you have a specialized market where the users are actually searching for jargon or slang terms around the product, and those actually sell more. But you should always kind of structure it. This goes towards CRO, I guess anything digital marketing wise. Structure your new projects um, so you can pull some actionable data out of it. So whether it's a landing page test, what am I actually going to get out of this? Because even if it doesn't work, if you can tie it back and say, oh, it's probably because I did this, let's try the test again, but remove this aspect from it. Whether say, you know, let's actually change out the ad, let's remove this element of the page. You can at least narrow it down and you won't be continually wasting your money anymore on things that aren't going to work. And even though PPC is heavily data driven and there's so many metrics, you know, we talked about the awareness side, but it's going to come down to how do you interpret the data? How do you fit it into the greater story? And similar to the SEO side, um, hopefully you have analytics or something set up like that so you can see what's happening after the user clicks the page. Because if you aren't using anything like analytics or an extra software package, you're going to see people going to the page. And um, you'll have your conversion metric saying that you know some of them made it to the other side, but what happened in between? And especially for something like e-commerce, because you don't need um, to do as much like lead, lead quality scrubbing, going through which leads are actually good. Not all purchases are created equal. So what can I do to maximize those high value purchases? And not that you want to kick out the low value purchases, but you don't want to be spending the same amount of money on people who are only going to spend ten dollars. We can optimize around the people who are going to come in and regularly spend like fifty, sixty dollars. Makes a lot of sense. All right, now here's one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> I've been in this for a while and it's like clockwork. Every couple of years uh, we will read about something that spells certain death for SEO and I love it. It used to make me nervous you know when I hadn't been in this very long. Oh no, is SEO really going to die? No, I don't really think it is um, and I'll tell you why. Because SEO is not about Google and it's not about um, Google's competition and it's not about mobile and it's not about maps and it's not really about any of that stuff. SEO is about people who go to a device to look for things. And um, you know like we talked about earlier a long time ago your search engine was a librarian or a card catalog or a radio or a television or a newspaper. You know now uh, engines catalog all the information they can find online and people know that's how you search for things and search engine optimization or optimizing your data to be found by search is going to last every bit as long as people who go to their device to look for things and when that stops SEO is going to be dead but I know I think enough about human behavior to know that for them this is working um, if you go to Google and you type something, you get the result very quickly. Maybe Google's not your engine of choice, but you go to Bing or you go to Facebook or you go to Yelp or you go to YouTube. Uh, all of these things are search engines. So when you have data that is crawlable and findable and you're working hard to present it in a way that is helpful to people, you are optimizing for search. And, you know, if if someone you know creates a system like they can snap their fingers and the answer appears hovering in a hologram in front of them then I worry about search engines uh, because they won't be as as needed but until that happens until there is a an entirely new way of getting the information that one needs search engine optimization is going to be around and I'm you know that that helps me sleep uh, Helps me realize that you know uh, we'll make the mortgage again next month. It's things like that. Now, uh, moving on, it's changing constantly. Um, Google fields roughly a hundred billion 
searches every month. Now those are spread out among local searches, map searches, video searches, image searches. Um, we want to make sure that you are ready for mobile. Um, you know, mobile device uh, penetration uh, has outpaced desktop for quite a while now. Tablets uh, are in terms of growth outpacing both of them but if you add up all the tablets and the phones in the world it's way more than all the desktop computers so we want to make sure that uh, your content is optimized well because if Google crawls through a site and realizes you know what this is way too slow to render on a 3G phone this is way too big and clunky to render properly on a screen with a small resolution there's a very good chance that you're not performing very well for mobile search. So in that sense, you need to be ready for all sorts of different devices. But look at the, you know, on the chart on the left, look how many smartphone users still, you know, and, and if you have kids especially, what do you use your smartphone for? You, they're mostly texting. Uh, you know, no one actually calls anyone any for anymore. I think I think people could actually uh, release a phone that doesn't actually have a phone on it, and I think it would take months before anyone really noticed. It's all about data, and it's about photography, and it's about uh, you know email and app usage. Um, but look down there, number six on the phone, still more than half the people use search. And look at you know the tablet users, much higher uh, penetration of search into tablet users. Now, another thing you need to realize is, you know, 10 years ago, people were optimizing their content for very simple queries that, that actually existed in the general consciousness, but Google decided, you know what, we're not really going to give you credit for being the number one person who knows what uh, 8 plus 8 is just because you have a web page built for that. If we can make a calculator, if we can pull from a knowledge graph, or if we can scrape and suck the data from Wikipedia, we're going to do it. So in a sense, you know, people optimizing five and ten years ago for the answers to very simple questions that normally could be found uh, on a, you know, rapidly in an encyclopedia, those people aren't getting much traffic anymore just because Google's sort of showing the results themselves and you never have to leave Google's um, page to uh, to find the answer, you know, uh, that keeps penetrating into different areas. You know, if you search flight status now, if you search for U.S. Air number 3418, you don't have to go to the U.S. Air site anymore. You don't have to go to a special app. Google will show you not only what the status of that flight is, but it'll give you a little cool little picture about the flight and how, how far it's gone from one city to the next. That's frustrating to a lot of web developers and content people who built content based on that but it is the landscape it you know you can complain about it but who's gonna listen nobody so search isn't going away the types of things that people are searching for change all the time uh, you know anytime you start typing into a, a Google box you'll get the suggested queries that's a really interesting look into human nature right there for example you know, why am I, and then you'll see the research results, why did she, why did he, why do men, why do women. Uh, it's very fascinating to see. I mean, it's, it's sort of, you know, Google's become the confidant and the counselor uh, to billions of people. So search isn't going away. The form that it takes, the way it, you know, what it takes to succeed in search gradually changes, uh, but it's nothing you can't keep up with if, if you have a little time devoted for it. So it's not going anywhere, but it's changing. Yeah, just one last note before we jump to the next one, Eric. Now that you mentioned earlier, you know, SEO is get, losing more and more of those search queries. And, you know, Google's that confidant and the counselor. I, I guess you're losing out on that now because sometimes you go through the search query reports on PPC and you're like, why is anyone searching for this? It's very entertaining. Kind of yes. scary. Yes, but. <laughs> yes it is. Here's a little bonus fact, number nine, technically, in our eight-item webinar. You can do both of these things. Um, I think we've been doing webinars with Hannafin, I think, since the late 1950s now, and we have a, you know, both of our sites have a nice little collection of them. They're on YouTube, they're on SlideShare, they're on the Intrapromote site, they're on the Hannafin site. We've spent a lot of time talking about how you can optimize these campaigns in unison. 
so that they're not cannibalizing each other, so that the staffing is worked out correctly, so that the budgets are taken care of. Uh, just a little plug for both of our uh, individual businesses here. We've done a lot of work to bring a lot of information to the webinar audiences, so feel free to check out both of those sites, and um, you know you'll find a lot of good stuff. Uh, and it's timeless, just like just like Jacob and I are timeless in our delivery. <laughs> no, I'm happy, I'm happy you mentioned that, Eric, because that's one of the things that's. Um... I think sometimes it seems like there should be some rivalry between our two groups. Like we just don't don't mix. It's the, I'm not familiar with West Side Story. Was it the Sharks, Jets, or something like that? There's you know <laughs> these back alley brawls between us. Right. But it, it's kind of funny because when you're doing well at one, the other one benefits as well. So you know it's one of the things on PPC. It makes our job so much easier if someone's willing to go and work on their SEO, whether it's in-house or they're working with an agency or something like that. And um, I, I guess I can't say the same thing going the other direction because I don't have the, uh, the experience with it, but I know there are a few studies. I was looking for the citation before, but when you can appear on both the, the paid and the organic, maybe it was from Google, maybe it was from someone else, but the click-through rates were up by like 36% or so. So if you can rank well on both, you're going to be in a pretty good position to have some success. Right. In nearly every situation, it is, it's a matter of real estate. You know, There is a given number of pixels, and let's be as many places as we can on that page. Okay. And now we're going to go into live poll question number four. Would you like help with your PPC or SEO accounts and management? If you are... You could select, I'm interested in A, a free account assessment from Hannapin, B, a free hour-long SEO consultation with Intrapromote, C, both, or D, no thanks. Okay. 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 Yeah, it looks like the... Uh, the poll's still going, but we're going to jump into the live question and answer time. Eric, was there anywhere you'd like to start? Otherwise, i got a, a list in front of me that I can start from, too. Uh, let me see. Yeah, there. You know, there's a couple here, but uh, go ahead with yours, and if you, uh, if you run out, I have a couple. We are rapidly coming up to the hour here. Okay. Okay, look, um... I'll choose one that I actually haven't mentioned anything about today, but I was actually working with our home director. I guess now he's technically our president of paid search, not paid search, president of the company at Hannibal Marketing. But he was giving a presentation on shopping campaigns. And one of the myths about that is, well, if I'm, if I'm running these Google shopping campaigns, or it's not the Bing ones, I'm just going to end up hurting my search campaigns because people are going to click those. I'm just, there's no point in doing the search. They're just going to kind of cannibalize each other and... I'm just going to lose out. I could tell you that is a myth. <laughs> they, they work very well together. One of the things you will have to keep in mind is there's always going to be a limited market with a product. You, you can only sell so many of, uh, let's go back to the shoe models, you can only sell so many of a shoe, especially if it's very specialized, like it's a very specialized hiking boot. There's only so many people that want to go hiking in that brand. But one of the things that I've found lately is that by running both kind of similar to what we just talked about with the SEO and the PPC, making sure that you are ranking for both, is we're actually seeing better results by having both show up. The biggest uh, impact for one of my clients running a Nike campaign for a select group of shoes that they were running. And on the search side, we've started to see a decrease in the actual revenue but we're making a lot more revenue now on the shopping side, and I'm crossing my fingers hoping this stays the same. It's actually coming out to be much cheaper on the shopping engines rather than going through the search side. So as well as, yeah, keep the holistic view, kind of look at your, I guess they're both on Google AdWords, but look at your search marketing as kind of a cohesive whole because they're all influencing each side, and you shouldn't say, I'm unless you only have a very limited amount of time or budget, you should never say, I'm just not going to focus on this because I really want to push this aspect. I want to push my products or I'm just going to kind of not worry about optimizing my PPC right now because I'm just going to, you know, maybe do SEO. I don't want to do PPC anymore. 
Right. You know, um, Jacob, that really ties into one of the questions that I had here that popped up. How can you use attribution models for action items? You know, those, and they're, they're really pretty charts. They create, you know, the nice Venn diagrams and the nice uh, bubble series in Google Analytics, for example. But how do you look at those and say, okay, now I know what to do? Um, and one of the things we recommend is, okay, let, you know, if you have your, uh, your attribution uh, model where it was like PPC, PPC sale, okay, great, you know, you understand PPC was important there, or maybe one organic visit followed by conversion, okay, great, no question there, that was important. But look at the ones where the last click or the, you know, the last touch came from a, a, a given channel, whether it's SEO or PPC or social media, and how, but how many of those had a first touch channel that was different from that? And think to yourself, okay, yeah, let's say a given channel, let's say SEO got, you know, was responsible for 55% for of your sales at the last touch model, but how many of those 55% came after they were originally touched by another channel? And could you live without those? So really what these multi-channel attribution models tell us is the importance of really covering as many bases as you can. Um, because you know what you need to do is visualize all of these uh, all of these various combinations of channels that result in conversions, but delete all of them that contain a certain channel. And that's what would happen if, in theory, you decided, well, I'm not going to dump money into this anymore. I'm going to I'm going to scale back on my SEO work. I'm going to I'm going to drop my budget, you know, down to 50 bucks on PPC just because I don't think it's doing anything. Well. Um, that's a nice predictor of what's going to happen uh, without you actually having to, to pull that trigger and, and see for yourself. Uh, because so we're learning so many of these conversions are so complicated and so reliant upon each other that it's a whole, you know, it's a whole big universe out there uh, that's very, very interrelated. And so you know, cutting off your nose to spite your face is an old cliche that sort of comes to mind when you think about, you know, cutting out a certain budget from one channel to apply it to another channel. Yeah, completely agreed, Eric. I guess this is the other side of why, um, you know, having to try and solve these problems because they can't be very difficult is, uh, well, we can just not worry too much. We have a little bit of job security for a while. Because, you know, it's not something that's very easy or readily apparent. Yeah, sadly, for the listeners, we can't say, well, just look at that. You're fine. <laughs> that's how you solve it. Done. Right. Okay. One more. Okay. Thanks for joining us. Um, we actually ran a little bit over. Hopefully, we didn't cut into your schedules or anything. But if you have any more questions, you can contact us directly. If you want to contact Hannapin, marketing at hannapin.com. And if you want to talk to Intrapromote, we're actually going to give you Eric's personal address, eric at intrapromote.com. So feel free to reach out with any questions, any comments, and we will talk to you next time. Great. Thanks so much, everyone, and thank you, Jacob. Thank you, too. It was great talking to you again.